Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Uh, I see the Zoom is still letting some folks in, so I'm going to wait just another few seconds for uh, our participants count to, to go up a little bit, and then we'll get started. So thanks so much for joining our emergency housing voucher webinar. Today, we're going to focus on coordinated entry. Um, so this is one in a series that we've been doing, and we're really excited to focus this time on uh, coordinated entry and the referral process. Next slide. So this session is being recorded. Like the other ones, the recording will be shared on the HUD EHV website. We'll drop the link to that in the chat. Thanks. Um, and the recordings and materials, including transcripts for uh, previous sessions, uh, are up there, uh, as is information about office hours and a, a lot of other useful information on that page. So you're going to be muted, as with all the other webinars. Um, if you're having trouble with your computer audio, you might want to try calling in using the, the phone number, which is here. Um, you can submit answers through the question and answer box. As we've done for other webinars, we're gonna to try to focus our sort of time and efforts today on questions that are related to coordinated entry and referrals. If you have questions on other topics, um, the best way to get them answered is to go to the EHV email box, which the information is listed on that website that we just dropped the link in there to. Um, and you can get your questions answered there or through the uh, Public and Indian Housing PIH office hours for PHEs uh, or the SNAPS office hours for continuums of care. Um, so if you have questions that are sort of unrelated to this topic, that would be the best uh, way to get them answered. Um, if you have te any technical issues today, just submit them through the Q&A box. All of those will go to the presenters. Next slide. Thank Thanks. Um, so once again, welcome. Uh, I'm Janice Iketa. I'm from CSH. I'm joined with several colleagues today. Um, CSH, along with the Technical Assistance Collaborative, TAC, are jointly running this webinar series with HUD on emergency housing vouchers. So today you're going to hear from me, as well as Micah Sneed, Hannah Roberts, and Joan Dominich. Next slide. So just as a reminder, uh, we're nearing the end of our sort of initial series of webinars here. This is coordinated entry. Next week, we're going to be talking about making the most of emergency housing voucher waivers, um, which is going to be an exciting session to think about, you know, how you dig in on um, implementation and using waivers to really maximize being able to serve people quickly and maybe serve people you haven't served with these kinds of resources before. Next slide. So quick poll, uh, who is listening in today? If you could just share if you're a public housing agency, a continuum of care, a victim service provider, or other. I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds so we have a sense of who we're talking to on the line today. Okay, so we're split pretty evenly between public housing agencies and continuums of care. Um, we've got a few victim service providers uh, and some other as well. So that's helpful to know. Next slide. Okay, so just a quick overview today, right? As we've been saying for the past few weeks, this emergency housing voucher program is very different from the housing choice voucher program. All those differences are outlined in the all important PIH notice 2021-15. Uh, this talks a lot about waivers and new requirements, and a significant requirement there is that PHAs partner with their continuum of care or continuums of care. Um, for referrals, as well as uh, homeless or 
other or victim service providers or other homeless providers in certain cases to assist with, uh, you know, getting qualified families referred. So today's webinar is going to focus on how communities uh, can update their coordinated entry process uh, and develop MOUs that, you know, highlight all the important information um, around processes to advance uh, equity and to assess, prioritize, and refer eligible people to the PHA for the EHV program. Next. So at the end of today, we're hoping that you'll be equipped to uh, have discussions about updating coordinated entry policies and procedures, uh, thinking about equitably assessing households and making direct referrals to public housing agencies. You should be able to identify opportunities to advance equity within your crisis response system and uh, increase coordinated entry capacity to handle referrals and uh, some strategies for expediting referrals. So we're going to talk through equity inclusion first. We're going to move into the specific requirements for emergency housing vouchers around coordinated entry um, into some planning, and then talking about some different components, access, uh, assessment, making successful referrals, and then the implementation and sort of continuous quality improvement of the process. Next slide. So just quickly, because I know we have a lot of continuums of care on the phone, but also lots of other folks. As a reminder, a continuum of care is a regional or local planning body that coordinates the housing and services funding for people experiencing homelessness in their area. Um, so the specific offerings that are available in each community are different, right? But co continuum of care funded services can include street outreach, emergency shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, and permanent supportive housing. And they also do a lot of planning and operating coordinated entry. And a coordinated entry system is uh, a centralized or coordinated assessment uh, that covers the whole geographic area of the COC. It's easily accessed by individuals and families seeking housing or services. It's well advertised and it includes uh, a comprehensive and standardized assessment tool, as well as a way to prioritize among eligible people to make referrals. Um, so this is a requirement for COCs to have a coordinated entry system um, and there uh, to have prioritization policies, you know, to prioritize based on need. But communities can adjust and evaluate their coordinated entry prioritization policies based on new information and circumstances, including new data, changing needs, available resources. Um, and this is something that we saw happen a lot in communities around the start of the pandemic, right? Communities made some shifts in priorities to really recognize the urgency of serving people who were most vulnerable to COVID-19, including people, uh, older adults and people who had uh, you know, underlying health conditions that the CDC said make you particularly at risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19. So this is uh, something we're gonna be talking a lot about today is how do you think about shifting priorities and uh, making your coordinated entry system work with these emergency housing vouchers. Next slide. So just a, a quick reminder uh, for folks or you know, new information for other ones. Coordinated entry has four core elements um, and it's all about streamlining access to services and resources in a community. So instead of having to apply at multiple different programs with their own processes, coordinated entry really centralizes access for people. Uh, who are experiencing homelessness or need assistance, right? It's going to provide a standardized assessment, and then it's going to allow the community to prioritize people for the resources that they have based on need and then make the appropriate referrals. Next slide. And next. So just some quick framing, and we've talked about this in some of the other webinars. So if you've been there, this is a recap, but just a reminder that emergency housing vouchers present us with this really historic opportunity to address racial and other inequities within your community and connect some of the most vulnerable people to permanent housing. So uh, public housing agencies, continuums of care and other stakeholders should be working together to determine how strategically to target these emergency housing vouchers and the services along with them to address unmet needs. And we talked a lot about this in the targeting webinar, which was last week, I believe. Um, and you can find that link on the EHV website. 
Another important framing piece for today is that we can't perpetuate inequity in the name of crisis or urgency. Yes, we're in crisis. Yes, we have an urgent situation right now, but we also need to be intentional about understanding how decisions about allocating these resources impact racial equity. And we need to think about every way that we can to reduce barriers, check biases and assumptions, um, and just avoid mistakes and other missed opportunities to advance equity as we build this new program together. Next slide. So just a little more framing on racial equity, right? And this opportunity to close the gaps on current inequities. So as we've shown before, right? We know that people of color, especially black or African American people, Hispanic and Latinx people, and uh, Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Island populations are all overrepresented in the percentage of people experiencing homelessness compared to the, you know, their um, presence in the regular population. Uh, and we know that um, these racial inequities are compounded um, when there's intersections with other historically marginalized populations, such as people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, uh, non-native speakers, um, and other uh, folks. Next slide. So something else that we know is that coordinated entry processes and tools can perpetuate and compound racial inequities, uh, or they can be used to intentionally advance racial equity. So that's one of the places where we say, you know, don't sacrifice equity um, in the, the face of crisis and urgency by just saying, we're gonna keep things the way they are to, to do this quickly, right? We really need to think about how our current systems might be perpetuating inequity. Um, so in 2019, the C4 Innovations Racial Equity Initiatives team released this study, the Coordinated Entry System Racial Equity Analysis of Assessment Data, which documented that you know, some of the tools that are often uh, conceived to be best practices right, and the processes that we use don't always ensure equity across our most disenfranchised communities. And so a lot of communities have been thinking about ways uh, to change coordinated entry systems for a while. And this is a great opportunity with these new resources to continue and build on that work or to start it if you haven't yet. Um, so there's a document here about strategies to advance equity and dismantle embedded racism in coordinated entry assessment and prioritization processes. We're gonna be talking about some of that stuff today, but this is still a great resource to look into. Next slide. Um, and something else that we talked a lot about in the uh, partnerships webinar, as well as the targeting webinar, is this importance of inclusive planning and decision making, right? So the process for making any changes related to coordinated entry um, around these emergency housing vouchers or otherwise, as well as you know, other important decisions should be inclusive, meaning that the people who are most impacted by your decisions uh, you know, policies, programs are involved with the planning, right? So this particularly includes people of color who are both disproportionately impacted by homelessness and COVID-19 um, and people with lived experience who uh, are currently experiencing homelessness or are at risk of homelessness um, and have been through these, these systems. Next slide. Uh, and just some tips, and as I said, we discussed this a lot more in the targeting webinar, but you're going to want to tap into the existing groups that you have, right? We know that PHAs are connected with resident advisory boards, COCs have uh, member board members and sometimes committees of people with lived expertise, um, their youth action boards or other youth groups and communities and whatever else you have, right? Um, you're going to want to make sure that a lot of different agencies and people at all different levels of staff are involved in decisions, uh, as, including culturally specific organizations that are led by and trusted by people from historically marginalized communities. Um, you're going to want to think not just about, you know, how are you including people in boards or other leadership forums, but in employment opportunities. Um, and just lots of ways to engage different program participants who have lived experience with all sorts of programs across your system. And we have this link here for more, you know, to see this uh, message on integrating persons with lived experience in our efforts to prevent and end homelessness. 
So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Hannah, who's going to talk about some of the specific coordinated entry requirements. Great. Thanks, Janice. Um, as we begin our discussion on coordinated entry and its roles in the emergency housing voucher program, we're going to get started with some review of basic requirements. Importantly, public housing authorities must accept referrals for emergency housing vouchers di directly from the coordinated entry system. The public housing authority must also take direct referrals from outside the coordinated entry system if the coordinated entry system does not have a sufficient number of eligible households to refer to the PHA or the coordinated entry system does not identify households that may be eligible for emergency housing voucher assistance because they are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking. In either of these two cases, the PHA must enter into a partnership to receive direct referrals from an appropriate entity such as a victim services provider or an anti-trafficking provider. Next slide. Additionally, public housing authorities can issue a voucher outside of the direct referral process from the coordinated entry system or other partnering organizations in order to facilitate an emergency transfer in accordance with the Violence Against Women Act, as outlined in the PHA's emergency transfer plan. COCs, victim service providers, and any other partnering agencies making direct referrals to the PHA must verify and provide supporting documentation to confirm that the referred household meets one of the four eligibility criteria. And attachments three and four of the EHV notice include sample certification forms. Um, for additional information on um, partnering and the roles of different partners, you can also check out the uh, partnerships webinar if you haven't already seen that. Next slide. As a reminder, a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU is required to detail the partnership and some of the minimum basic requirements. Um, PHAs that agree to accept EHVs must enter into this MOU with a partnering COC no later than July 31st of this year. The roles and responsibilities of the PHA, COC, and other partners, including but not limited to the COC making direct referrals of families to the PHA through the coordinated entry system must be included. A sample MOU template is included um, as attachment two in the EHV operating requirements notice. Um, and the sample MOU language includes both the ro PHA roles and responsibilities um, including accepting direct referrals um, from the COC coordinated entry system. Next slide. Um, eligibility categories are defined by statute, but the MOU should outline how eligible households will be prioritized for referral by coordinated entry and other providers if applicable. As Janice mentioned before, communities can evaluate and update their coordinated entry prioritization policies based on evolving information and circumstances, including new and improved data, changing needs and priorities, and available resources. Strategies for prioritizing households in coordinated entry for referral to the PHA can include specific numbers of emergency housing vouchers targeted to certain eligible populations, as well as subpopulations within it. HUD strongly encourages communities, communities to take into account the comparative health risks of COVID-19 when identifying strategies for prioritization among and within the different eligible populations, and especially the needs of people living in environments where practicing social distancing or taking other preventive measures is challenging such as living in unsheltered situations, congregate shelters, and time-limited non-congregate shelters. Those at greatest risk for severe impact from COVID-19 also include people of color, especially Black and Indigenous people, older adults, and those with underlying health conditions. Um, for more on identifying priority populations, we'll also drop a link for the um, targeting webinar um, that was done last week. Next slide. And although many PHAs and COCs may have experience working together around, uh, for example, special purpose vouchers, um, homeless and moving on preferences, project-based vouchers, um, and many other efforts, emergency housing vouchers, as we've said several times now, are different. 
Um, the requirement for PHAs to accept direct coordinated entry referrals will, in many cases, require PHAs and COCs to work together in ways that they haven't done so before. This is a great opportunity for COCs and PHAs and other partners to combine their strengths, um, best practices, and lessons learned to move their communities closer to ending and preventing homelessness. So a few tips on thinking about um, how to maximize these partnerships, um, starting with building on work that you've done together in the past and using lessons learned to improve your approaches to emergency housing vouchers, respecting the deep expertise and strengths um, that MOU partners bring to the table and build structure for coordination that leverages those strengths. Next slide. Additionally, communities are encouraged to um, utilize community stakeholders with expertise on equity considerations to guide your analysis and decision making about the use of emergency housing vouchers, um, ensuring that people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ+, and other impacted populations are owners, planners, and decision makers, and using the MOU to clearly document these roles, responsibilities, as well as timelines, goals, and expectations around the referral process. Next slide. Um, so on updates to your coordinated entry system, in addition to establishing an MOU, communities should also consider any ways in which they may need to update coordinated entry, coordinated entry policies and procedures to incorporate emergency housing voucher referrals and the eligible and prioritized populations. Um, next, we're going to discuss some of the specific aspects of coordinated entry and considerations that you might want to use, starting with inclusive planning and collaboration. Um, from there, we'll move on to thinking about different elements of your coordinated entry system to meet three goals, ensuring equitable access, um, assessing an el eligible and prioritized households, and making successful referrals. And then we'll close with um, some implementation and continuous quality improvement considerations. Next slide. And before we dig into those details, um, we're going to talk through a lot today and we'll hopefully answer a lot of your questions, but we also wanted to flag for you all that if you need more tailored assistance or have really specific questions, there are additional resources available. If you have concerns um, in particular about the capacity of your coordinated entry system, we'd also encourage you to reach out by email to ehv at hud.gov. Um, also consider reaching out to your HUD field office or any technical assistance providers that you're currently working with um, who can work with you to identify potential sources of funding and or give technical assistance to help streamline um, this process. Uh, so next slide, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Micah. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everybody. So we've talked a lot about uh, inclusive planning and, and processes so far, and so now we're going to spend just a couple of minutes looking at planning specifically as it relates to coordinated entry and emergency housing vouchers. So obviously, we can't navigate to a new place without knowing where we're starting, and to do that, we really need to take a close look at our system as it is today in the real world, not just uh, on paper and our, and our plans and our, our written standards. And, and that way we can address what needs to be done to effectively implement a coordinated entry process for our emergency housing vouchers. To do that, we wanna start by assessing our system and, and asking a couple questions, really digging into how things are going. Uh, some of these questions are listed here in particular, I want to start with uh, just leading right off of Hannah's points about uh, implementing a great planning system. First question, are marginalized populations represented in your planning team and leadership? Uh, not just collaboration, but meaningful collaboration and in fact, leadership from marginalized populations. Do you have an active prioritized by name list of emergency housing voucher eligible uh, and prioritize and interested participants. Uh, many probably not. Notices uh, right on about three weeks old so far. Uh, so we probably don't have a great list right now. But if not, what would it take to get there? Uh, you know, have you moved towards prioritization for your community, uh, and then all the steps that will flow out once you've gotten there? Uh, do you again to, to Hannah's point earlier about uh, do you have concerns about your capacity to identify, assess, and refer? 
emergency housing voucher eligible and prioritized populations. And if you don't, let us know. Again, hit the email, check out the website, and we can see what we can do to get you help. Obviously, we're not going to have all the answers to all these questions here today, but we'll be working through a lot of them as we move forward, and we're going to work on them together. Uh, are there partner agencies that can help you identify and assess specific prioritized populations? And we'll talk more about specific strategies around uh, ensuring folks have access to the coordinated entry system and how we assess uh, the eligible populations for this program. And last but not least, do you currently make direct referrals uh, to any public housing authorities now? If not, do you have an idea of what that process could look like? Uh, great time to start talking about it. And we'll talk through some of those tips as well. Next slide. And we know that a plan only lasts in a perfect form on paper. So we really do need to think about the potential obstacles, barriers, challenges that exist out in the world, but also some things that uh, changes or how we prioritize could have ripple effects across the system. Uh, in particular, we wanna identify processes that can or must be simplified to reduce time and increase staff capacity. And that could be everything from uh, the day-to-day -day workflow and, and managing assessments and prioritization and, and managing your, your prioritization list. But it might also include looking at your, your governing processes and who needs to make uh, decisions in order to uh, approve changes or update policies and procedures. We've seen a lot of uh, communities and continuums of care across the country uh, try to simplify their process in the last year in response to COVID. We also want to make sure you're able to leverage uh, not only the available emergency housing vouchers, uh, but in addition to that, continuum of care funded programs, emergency solutions grant funded programs, housing opportunities for persons with aid, uh, waivers, uh, COVID response funding like uh, emergency solution grant CV or the CARES Act funded emergency solutions grant programs, in addition to Treasury's emergency rental assistance program to ensure all the kind of necessary services and available support that's in your community right now can be brought to bear in your, uh, your workflow and, and what resources you're able to provide households that you're working with. You also want to explore and document how changes to the coordinated system will impact other projects like rapid rehousing, like permanent supportive housing. If you're able to join us last week to talk about some of those strategies for targeting different prioritized populations, uh, you also need to dig into kind of like what will the next steps be if we're going to prioritize individuals in rapid rehousing, if we're going to prioritize individuals in permanent supportive housing, or if we're not gonna prioritize them, what is the other plan uh, for those populations and addressing their needs? Next slide. Again, emergency housing vouchers present a historic opportunity to address racial and other inequities within your community and connect some of your most vulnerable populations with permanent housing. So big planning step for that is understanding what those local inequities are and how your coordinated entry related outcomes, how your process can, can work to address those. So we've got a couple of links here, in particular useful resources, uh, one product using the data you have. Uh, and it's really important that you not only tap into the data that you have, but not allow yourself to kind of be paralyzed by, but we don't have all the data. Um, so, so what can we do? How can we improve on what we have and use what we have while we look toward uh, improving that data going forward, as well as HUD's Stella P race and ethnicity analysis guide, really great opportunity to invest in yourselves, invest in your community, invest in how you use data, whether it's in doing data analysis or communicating out with data visualization. So I want everybody to check out uh, the Stella P tools that are available. And consider if you haven't already or if you haven't recently conducting a racial equity impact assessment to examine how different racial and ethnic groups could be affected by changes to coordinated entry, right? So we talked about those ripple effects and kind of being on the lookout for if, if we move this group in this direction, what will that do to our other groups? Or if we try to balance resources in one area versus another. Um, so again, we've got uh, racial equity as a foundation for your community, a product that you can look at and consider more information there. And next slide. So again, to bring it back to uh, how our plan is going to work to address 
equity inequities within our system, and then of course ensure fair housing in the implementation of our process and, and distribution of emergency housing vouchers. We wanna make sure everyone's being intentional in combating impediments to fair housing and maximizing the opportunities to expand housing choice through emergency housing vouchers for people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals and other historically marginalized populations. A, a couple of examples of how to do that, ways that we can collaborate on strategies are establishing higher payment standards than we're normally able to for housing choice vouchers on the uh, PHA or Public Housing Authority side, uh, being able to use, take advantage of the emergency housing vouchers opportunity for higher payment standards can increase the pool of high quality accessible units located in areas of opportunity. We also have some great landlord incentives that are baked into the emergency housing voucher program that should help us persuade landlords to lower barriers to entry. Um, we really do wanna hear though about uh, other specific impediments to both the equity and fair housing in your community. So I encourage you to reach out, uh, let us know if you need particular strategies. If you have, whether it's affordability, housing choice, um, racism, discrimination by landlords, uh, lack of access for people with disabilities, stigma for people experience different challenges, um, and really think about how not only a continuum of care and a public housing authority can, co can collaborate to overcome those impediments, but what is the larger network of, of providers and engaged agencies and stakeholders within your community who can help you plan around those challenges? Next slide. And finally, uh, in this section, we just wanna talk about, uh, you know, moving from planning to action and, and a couple of actions that you can take now and going forward. So these are actions you can initiate, invest in, or just kind of double down on if you've been doing them so far to improve your coordinated, coordinated entry system and processes. First, if there's a coordinated entry evaluation process in place, or if you need to put one in place, do that so you can identify whether it's discriminatory discriminatory practices whether they are intentional or based on implicit bias consider the impact of external sources of discrimination and bias on participants movement through coordinated entry to emergency housing vouchers example that might be discrimination by private market landlords but also look at are there inequities that we are continuing to prop up within our system because we are not ensuring access. We are not properly assessing individuals for eligibility and prioritization. How are we supporting folks after we make a referral and then looking long-term, how are we supporting uh, households after they lease up into the program? So we know that discrimination can come from many different uh, places and different shapes. Uh, and so we wanna make sure we're casting our eye as far as we can to identify those internally and externally. Last but not least, developing and collecting a standardized set of data that can be used to understand disparities and inequities within your system. And we've got a great product here on data sharing, very timely, it came out last year uh, to talk about data sharing between public housing authorities and continuums of care to collaborate and analyze data more effectively. So this will be a very different kind of data sharing that we've seen in most communities between housing authorities and continuums of care. But we really hope it's a great opportunity to invest and identify and, and ultimately defeat any kind of barriers and equities that we have in our community. And next slide. Okay, so we just wanna take a second here, maybe pull you back to the computer if you've wandered away, but uh, just ask where are you generally in your emergency housing voucher planning? Uh, you just met or are imminently meeting your continuum of care or your housing authority. Uh, you are, your housing authority has accepted vouchers and y'all are ready to work on your memorandum of understanding. You have a strong housing authority continuum of care partnership already in place. And so you'll be adding these new resources or up updating your existing process to accommodate the new resource or what is emergency housing voucher EHVs? We'll just give it one more second. Okay, and so 47%, uh, nearly a majority of folks 
uh, on our line today have uh, their housing authority has accepted the voucher and are ready to work. Obviously, a uh, few folks are confused about what EHV or emergency housing vouchers are. Uh, and then some 31% already have a strong PHA continuum of care partnership in place. And we'll just be adding this into the, into the resource bin, into the toolbox. That's great. Uh, just know uh, for folks in that category, we're going to be reaching out to you because as we said, there's uh, many more folks who have not done this before, who have not had this type of partnership. And it will be just really helpful nationally, locally, regionally uh, to have partnerships come together and show neighbors, maybe within your community, maybe outside of your community, how you are working together, uh, what those lessons learned are and how folks can build their own capacity. Okay, so I am gonna hand it off to Hannah to talk about ensuring access, one of the first key components of the coordinated entry process. All right, so in this section, we're gonna share considerations for ensuring and expanding access, a critical component of any coordinated entry system. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about access? Um, access sites serve as the entry point to our homeless service system where households experiencing an at-risk of homelessness may be assessed and connected to available housing resources. Um, in order to create a more equitable coordinated entry system, it is crucial that access sites are convenient, approachable, safe, and trusted spaces. Um, to ensure eligible and prioritized populations can access the EHV program in particular, um, PHAs and COCs should collaborate with people with lived experience, people of color, and people from historically marginalized populations to identify and plan around historical and current current barriers in ways that um, will increase access to the system. Um, this may include examining issues of communication, trust, geography and transportation, technology, lack of coverage, safety, um, immigration status and consideration for um, disparate impacts. Next slide. So clear communication about the EHV program will be crucial to making sure that folks throughout your community understand what the EHV program is. Communities should simplify, streamline, and ensure constant and clear communication, both internally and externally, on the how, what, where, when, and why of the EHV program. And in particular, external communication should be designed with and for people who are representative of the population that the EHV program serves to ensure um, clarity of messaging to those who may benefit from the program. Uh, communities should also ensure that information is provided in accessible formats as needed and take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access for people with limited English proficiency. Um, you should also consider ways in which you can reach across geographic gaps through media and public awareness and ensure applicants can reach you through direct contacts and communities um, online and by phone. And again, talking with folks who um, have needed to access programs similar to this will be really instrumental in thinking through what are the best ways to release communications in a way that will get to the folks that you're trying to reach. Next slide. Um, existing and expanded partnerships will also be crucial to closing the gaps that make your system inaccessible and ensuring that each emergency housing vouchers are truly reaching those that are, um, are intended to serve. A lack of coverage in an area should be a burden for the system, not the applicants. So everything that we can do to um, put the, the responsibility for navigation onto our system and our providers and make it as simple as possible for potential applicants will help um, improve equity in the, the access sites. Um, cover your gaps by connecting with city government, county governments, courts, education systems, and other trusted partners who can help bridge any divides or gaps that you may have and help potential applicants um, both gain information and access to the system itself. Outreach, um, engage and collaborate with partner agencies and people known to your eligible populations to build trust for and with the PHA and referring agencies, considering how you will target um, in an intentional way the needs of people facing high COVID transmission and health risks. Um, for example, due to being in congregate shelters, time-limited non-congregate shelters, um, or in unsheltered situations. Next slide. Access points should also be as low barrier as possible. 
Um, you should use technology to your advantage, but don't make it a requirement for applicants. Um, you may be able to address coverage and capacity gap gaps with technology, like accessible websites, automated answering or calling systems, mass notification systems um, via email and texting. Um, but be careful not to over rely on any technological tools that may be difficult for some populations to access especially if you're monitoring your data and see trends and underutilization. Online applications, if you choose to use them, should be as simple as possible and require as little information as necessary um, and should really be followed up um, with live contact um, when someone could request further information and documentation. Um, finding local partners could also be helpful um, to help connect um, folks to online applications, again, if you choose to use them, um, and make sure that we're, we're promoting warm referrals rather than um, cold referrals just to websites or hotlines that may be difficult for some uh, more vulnerable families to access. Next slide. Uh, we also should think about the ways that we can integrate trauma-informed approaches um, to increase access to our coordinated entry system, um, starting by considering how to make the entry and access procedures, assessments, and other processes as strength-based and trauma-informed, um, including racial trauma-informed as possible. Um, ensure that staff understand how trauma may be impacting households that present for assessment, and how to conduct assessments using strength-based and trauma-informed approaches. And finally, communicating clear and written protocols and guidance on how to best respond and refer um, when individuals disclose experiences of violence. Um, process must allow services to operate with as few barriers to entry as possible and provide survivor-driven choice. Next slide. Another important aspect of creating low barrier and accessible coordinated entry systems is the capacity to meet individuals and families where they are. Um, whether through formal MOU or leveraging other partnerships, um, identify roles and responsibilities for implementation and evaluation of outreach and access activities. Um, consider how are your street outreach, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, victim service providers, and drop-in centers um, operating, and how can they help you in sharing information and engaging with participants? You already know that for each of those programs, that's a, a space that has direct connections to people who may be eligible. So make sure that you utilize those partners to help share information, making sure that information about the uh, emergency housing vouchers is as clear and accessible as possible. And once accessed, um, consider how participants will remain in contact, whether it be through a case manager, a coordinated entry navigator, a call center, a drop-in center, technology, or other options that they may be able to utilize as they move through the process. This is particularly important for folks that are more vulnerable and may not have consistent access um, to a single location or to a single phone number, um, that these programs are working as, as hard as they can to create plans to remain in contact with those families throughout the assessment and referral process. Um, and ensure prioritized participants are engaged with services so they maintain whatever stability is possible for them while they are moving toward an emergency housing voucher. Um, so we want this process to move as quickly as possible, but making sure we continue to attend to folks' needs um, while they are um, working their way through that process. Next slide. Communities should also consider ways um, that they might be able to expand access capacity and improve the quality of services at access sites. Um, frontline staff, whether they're directly employed um, by the continuum of care or the PHA or working with a partner agency, should have a baseline um, for quality communication and implementation. So this should start with making sure um, the same way we're talking through all the details of the emergency housing voucher program today, that all of the frontline staff that will be working to connect families um, to this program um, understand all of the details of the emergency housing voucher program as well as other best practices like racial equity, trauma-informed care, implicit bias, and housing first principles. Next slide. 
Some additional um, considerations for capacity building with staff teams um, would involve um, general engagement and training um, on, of access and assessment staff and housing navigators to ensure um, that they clearly understand each step of the emergency housing voucher program and the processes that you put in place in your local community, including the priority populations, um, the requirements of the program, and the process for completing assessments and referring to emergency housing vouchers. Uh, you should also consider, to the extent you can, hiring and training additional staff uh, with an emphasis on hiring folks that are trusted by people experiencing homelessness. Um, including people of color in your community to ensure equitable access and referral process processes at each of your access sites. Next slide. Um, strategies to improve access should also be tailored specifically to the needs of each of the four eligible populations and any subpopulations that you're prioritizing within your community. So in these Last few slides on access, we'll talk through um, a few specific considerations depending on the eligible populations that you might be working with, um, starting with those that are currently experiencing homelessness. You should consider that um, households who reside in either congregate or non-congregate shelter, unsheltered situations, or who are at imminent risk of homelessness may need additional support. Um, to access emergency housing vouchers, especially if they are not already connected to the community's coordinated entry system. Um, you should consider ways that you might be able to expand outreach and engagement with these populations, which of course um, is challenging when everyone is already spread thin, but consider um, ways in which your community might be able to coordinate with additional partners, um, inclusively street outreach teams, um, but also others like emergency respondents, responders, um, justice and carceral systems, community and civic-based organizations, and faith-based organizations that could um, act as liaisons and help to spread the word and connect folks into the coordinated entry system. Next slide. Uh, the at-risk category um, includes households with less than 30% of area median income without resources to prevent homelessness um, and are experiencing active housing instability. Also includes um, unaccompanied youth and children and households with children and youth defined as homeless under the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. Um, many communities may already have prioritized assistance for at-risk households using emergency rental assistance or ESG homeless Preve prevention funds. Um, emergency housing vouchers could also be used to assist communities by providing permanent housing vouchers to these households. Um, so another great opportunity for collaborating um, with partners would be to collaborate with your emergency rental assistance and ESG recipients youth and child providers and school systems to ensure again that everyone within this population is aware of and has access to um, the uh, emergency housing vouchers. Next slide. Uh, the third eligible population um, under the EHV notice um, includes uh, people fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking or human trafficking. Uh, we know that in the last year, it has become even more clear that survivors of violence um, are experiencing high levels of stress, trauma, and health impacts that often require housing interventions and flexible supportive services. Survivors are often coping with significant trauma caused by their abuse experiences, um, including managing stress while working to heal and protect themselves. These experiences can have a disparate impact on survivors, such as women, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, LGBTQ people, and others in high-risk communities. To keep survivors safe, coordinated entry processes must address how all people will have safe and confidential access. This includes providing a private physical space for collecting data and providing referrals. Survivors may choose not to disclose information about violence, but by giving people an opportunity to disclose as part of the coordinated entry process, staff are communicating that sexual assault, domestic violence, and trafficking issues are priorities. Consider out-of-the-box approaches, such as virtual opportunities and resources for groups, 
peer-to-peer -peer sessions, spiritual connections to faith communities to support families during crisis, and online educational support for parents with children. And we've included a couple um, of links here that we'll drop into the chat box that are specific to serving survivors through the coordinated entry system. Next slide. Um, and next on ensuring access for people who recently experienced homelessness. Um, consider your community's current inventory of rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing programs and um, connect to those providers to ensure that to the extent you're serving this population that you have effective, clear communication with management, staff, and program participants um, so that they are clear about what the emergency housing voucher program is and can make informed um, choices about applying. ESG and CSC funded projects in particular should have eligibility verification data and case notes, as well as relationships to support engagement and follow up as participants may be prioritized um, and if they accept an emergency housing voucher opportunity. Next slide. And finally, on access for waitlisted housing, um, households um, that may be on the PHA waitlist. Just wanted to remind folks that PHAs must inform households on their waiting list of the availability of emergency housing vouchers by at a minimum, either posting the information to their website or providing public notice in the respective communities. COCs and PHAs must collaborate to ensure effective communication on how to contact COC or other refer referral partners to be assessed for eligibility for EHV assistance. Um, and if PHAs have a preference for victims of domestic violence or homeless households, they must also refer those applicants on their waiting list to the COC or a referring partner. Um, so COC should begin now to con um, consider the ways in which they can assist by ensuring online, telephone, and in-person access to the assessment process and clearly communicating um, any changes to the PHAs and to the community and partnering agencies um, around how that um, access and assessment process works. And next slide, and I will pass it back to Micah. Great, thanks, Anna. So we wanna talk about assessments. And in this context, uh, and you can go to the next slide, assessments is the process or Assessment, assessing is a process of gathering information about the strengths, needs, and barriers to housing for applicants and potential applicants. And, and while this, the Continuum of Care program interim rule requires the use of a comprehensive and standardized assessment tool to, uh, to ensure that the same assessment is being applied to Micah, is being applied to Hannah, is being applied to Janice. Everyone who presents or could potentially present receives the same assessment. It's really important to note that specific assessment tools, question, answers, uh, scores, ranking, they should only be used as an information gathering instrument that is part of an assessment process. And again, as we've seen over the last year, year and a half, many continuums of care have updated their process in response to COVID-19 and to advance racial equity. Uh, this is an excellent opportunity with emergency housing vouchers to further revise their assessment process since uh, you may not currently have a way to assess certain eligible populations, uh, such as people who are at risk for homelessness or people who were recently homeless. So we're going to spend a couple minutes here uh, talking about how you may update your assessment process. Next slide. Okay, so uh, again, last week, highly recommend everybody check out the targeting uh, prioritized populations within your community to look at strategies for how to uh, prioritize populations within the eligible potential participants of your emergency housing vouchers. Once you've made that prioritization, your coordinated entry assessment tools, policies, and procedures can be very helpful to identifying how you prioritize people. And what's really important is that all these tools, your process is steeped in your community's local context. You can use factors such as 
uh, rates of civic participation, incarceration rates, area median income, to potentially identify literal geographic areas that need targeted strategies that are informed by residents. Uh, it's important, of course, to ensure that uh, you are not using a protected class as the sole basis for decisions on housing and to ensure that assessment questions account for the different experiences of vulnerability and barriers facing racial and ethnic groups. The way that we assess clients' needs and assign a weight or a score to those assessments uh, in the process must consider the full depth and breadth of these intersecting experiences and vulnerabilities. Consider for ex for instance, housing barriers such as criminal records, poor credit histories, and histories of evictions, all of which disproportionately impact people of color as vulnerabilities. These factors often contribute to difficulties accessing and maintaining housing and health outcomes. Uh, you must also consider who is asking questions to gain information, how questions are being asked, where they are being asked, et cetera. Next slide. Now the assessment process can also be used to begin documenting eligibility, right? So each, uh, each eligible population has a different eligibility criteria. Uh, so we want, as you collect information and, and, and thinking about how you collect the minimal information required to identify what resources uh, someone could best benefit from, uh, you are probably gonna collect some information that will give you presumptive eligibility. And that can help you inform the next steps uh, based on somebody's population. So for example, income documentation is not required for literally homelessness eligibility, but it is for at risk of homelessness. Recently homelessness or recent experience of homelessness will be defined very locally by your continuum of care. And it will vary differently, you know, possibly widely differently from people fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking or human trafficking. So keeping that in mind, as you adjust your prioritization, as you establish your prioritization and then continue to review uh, how you collect information and how that informs next steps, documentation. Uh, we, in, in thinking about eligibility and other screening, we really want to see folks take advantage of the more permissive policies for emergency housing vouchers, uh, which you can read a lot about in the notice, but also learn much more about next week during making the most of emergency housing vouchers webinar. In short, we wanna ensure that everyone understands the, your public housing authority's prohibitions and work with staff at all levels to design a strength-based process for collecting information that could be used to an applicant's benefit. We have to remember that some folks may not volunteer information depending on how and who and where is asking the question, but especially when we're prioritizing among our four eligible populations, it's really important that if we don't collect uh, good information from them, uh, to speak to their vulnerabilities, we may be inadvertently screening someone out of the program. Next slide. So we're gonna talk through a couple considerations for our eligible populations. In particular, assessments for people experiencing homelessness, uh, whoever is doing the assessment uh, should work directly with outreach teams, housing providers, people with lived experience, and other relevant groups to discuss how to streamline connections to your emergency housing vouchers. This may mean conducting assessments where people are literally in the shelters or in an unsheltered situation. And we really want to consider that many assessments and assessment tools may be determined, excuse me, may be designed to determine which households need permanent supportive housing and which do not. Emergency housing vouchers do not come with supportive services uh, long-term baked into the program. So communities should work with local stakeholder stakeholders to build a package of services and carefully assess the population for need to ensure there's an adequate match between the household's desires and needs and what your emergency housing voucher program will offer. Next slide. 
I mean, thinking about assessing people who are at risk of homelessness, targeting at risk populations requires identifying factors within your community that lead to homelessness and developing an assessment tool to determine who will be served and what kind of assistance they'll receive. Assessments for at risk populations really should focus on information that is timely and relevant to the current housing situation, such as what are their other potential options? What are their income and expenses? Uh, do they need to move to new housing, retain their current housing, uh, or do they, in, in particular, when we talk about uh, victims, survivors attempting to flee, and, and especially when we think about uh, victims of sex trafficking, they may need to move to a new community, a new state across the country. So keeping all these things in mind, think about how you consider and understand other resources that may best serve a household before referral to an emergency housing voucher. A list of some of those services here. We have a little bit of alphabet soup for you, and I'll attempt to translate emergency solutions grant, community development block grant, both of which have received supplemental funding through the CARES Act or the CV that you see there, supportive services for veterans' family, temporary aid to needy family, and emergency rental assistance can be really helpful resources for at risk populations, depending on the need and your community's resources. Next slide. Okay, and so again, thinking about assessments, particularly for people fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, they may face a flurry of assessment questions that don't tell their whole story. Uh, and in particular, we wanna identify that intimate, intimate trauma can be extremely hard to disclose to a stranger, even when seeking help. So we wanna ensure that everybody is using trauma-informed assessments to increase the likelihood of disclosure and accuracy of any assessment. If I burst into a room and ask a couple of questions ill-timed or in a poor manner, I'm gonna get less information and be less able from the get-go to assist a person in front of me. So a brief but focused conversation with survivors can cover the topics most relevant to choosing a strategy that's most likely to lead to safe and stable housing for them. Uh, tremendous resources and, and all props due to the team at the Domestic Violence and Housing Technical Assistant Consortium. They offer a decision tree for assessing and appropriately responding to the housing needs of, of survivors. And you'll find that uh, a couple of links here that will share transforming our coordinated entry systems to increase survivors access and determining housing needs uh, for DVSV survivors. Next slide. Uh, assessments for people who recently experienced homelessness, again, this is going to be locally defined by your community, uh, but you, uh, you still want to ensure that there's a fair and transparent process that lets eligible households opt in to be assessed and removes the possibility of staff bias influencing which households get access to what resources. You also wanna ensure that you're assessing household for emergency housing vouchers, as well as other resources that might be available to help them achieve long-term housing and not be narrowly focused on EHV as the only solution, but having a conversation, trying to determine what other needs exist and what other resources might be best matched to their needs will be really helpful for people recently experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Uh, and so a couple options here in thinking about uh, people who have recently experienced homelessness. Uh, first, uh, in the term we often hear bridging or bridging out of rapid rehousing, which is a time limited rent assistance program, your assessment process can work to identify factors that indicate the household may need continued rental assistance for long-term stability. That might be look like their, their income. And, and as we know, people who were seemingly successful in rapid rehousing a year ago, do the economic and health impact of COVID-19 no longer have that stability? Have they previously experienced multiple episodes of homelessness, evictions, uh, kind of churn through the system and, and through different programs? Have they previously been evicted? Uh, some of these factors can help contribute to uh, identifying folks who might need assistance bridging out of rapid rehousing. Your assessment should also consider if a household is likely to need intensive services to retain housing, intensive services which uh, are often not found in a lighter touch or, or progressively engaged participants in rapid rehousing. This may indicate that uh, moving from rapid rehousing to an emergency housing voucher isn't the best fit, and they may in fact be better suited for a transfer to permanent supportive housing. Next slide. 
And in thinking about identifying people and households who are currently in permanent supportive housing and helping them move on from that program into a step down or, or less service enriched environment. Uh, first, it's always important to note that moving on, moving out of, moving up from permanent supportive housing is voluntary. Uh, assessments, uh, how they score prioritization should never be used to force or pressure uh, tenants of your permanent supportive housing to pursue moving on if it's something they're not interested in. But if you have a program and interested participant, your assessment tools can provide objective standards to guide discussion about what it takes to maintain housing stability without PSH services and how tenants are currently doing in maintaining their housing uh, with or without those services. Uh, we've got incredible toolkits here, a lot of great resources for much more on moving on assessments, including example tools, uh, a webinar, and a toolkit that goes into much more depth. But in the next slide, we will look at factors to consider uh, specifically for uh, addressing folks moving on from PSA. So thinking about housing stability, has the household demonstrated an ability to pay rent and utilities on time? Uh, do, are they not getting lease violations, notices? Do they have a long history of tenancy in the unit they're currently in? When thinking about their finances, does their income cover their rent? Does it cover their bills, other expenses that fluctuate over time? Do they have sufficient income to cover expenses after moving on, right? And so if you no longer have that case manager, that full intensive service of permanent supportive housing, how are you able to maintain that income and take care of your other needs? And has have you assessed the credit uh, of, a, of a household in permanent supportive housing and, and what that history, how they are limited or have more opportunities based on their credit history? And then last but not least, does the household require minimal or no services? Is it somebody that just has to do that monthly call check-in? Uh, or is the household connected with community-based providers? So they don't need to call their COC funded case manager, their continuum program case manager, uh, but they actually have supports found in other places. And on the next slide, we will talk about general assessment design and action steps. So we're ready to move forward. We've, we've, we've done all the planning that we can do. What can we get into action? So a couple of actions here, develop and provide appropriate training and support to leadership and staff administering the process. Everybody needs to be on the same page. It's, it's really important and, and creating an open environment where folks can ask questions, express concerns, uh, and can communicate openly. Again, a plug for a racial equity impact assessment to determine how different racial and ethnic groups may be affected by your system, by changes to your system. And thinking about your assessment and questions that you'll use to capture vulnerabilities, uh, ensure that you are working with people with lived experience, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, people with disabilities. Focus particularly on vulnerabilities of people facing high COVID transmission and health risk, whether it's because of their housing situation or their health situation, and both, right? Uh, as always, listen to people experiencing homelessness. Listen to your eligible participants, people who uh, formerly were, uh, would have been eligible for your program, and include their experiences in the assessment, whether it's through quantifiable factors like moves and length of time homeless, or qualitative with case notes, whether it's past engagement with social services, express fears and desires about what housing program they are. And in particular, when you're engaging with people with lived expertise, they are gonna tell you, that doesn't really mean much for me. Here's another suggestion on a question that can get to this. Um, ensure representative staffing and culturally responsive organizations, and always keeping an eye on your assessment outcome. So again, as Janice told us up the front, we've seen a lot of incidents where uh, assessment tools and other assessment processes have exacerbated or continued to hold up inequities within our community. So we wanna ensure that we're not doing that going forward and we stop that cycle now. Compare outcomes between white versus black, white versus indigenous, white versus people of color, and non-Latinx versus Latinx populations. And next slide, we will move into making successful referrals. So your referral system, as needed should be updated early and often to make it simple, fast, and easy as possible to get referrals to your public housing authority or your public housing authorities. Next slide. 
If you haven't already started, and again, knowing that we're just you know within the three weeks of the launch of the program and the notice, uh, it's a great time to start talking about what technology your housing authority and your COCs can use for referrals. Maybe one or you, one of you or both of you have a great system in place already, or maybe it's an area where you're going to need in a little investment or kind of translating between the two systems, what needs to be done and how we can get there. If there's a current coordinated entry referral system in use with a housing authority, identify the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities to innovate and, and do something new and different for your emergency housing vouchers. Referrals really should be process dependent, not people dependent. And, and we know that this is uh, a limitation and in, in many times a strength in communities, right? Uh, whether it's Hannah is just a knockout kind of coordinated entry referral manager, or Janice is an incredible case manager that's able to get uh, into contact with folks no matter where they are and, and get a move through the process quickly. Sometimes we are very reliant on the staff who work in these different positions. Uh, we're more reliant on the staff than we are on the process. So we really wanna make sure we have well-documented, uh, considered processes as well as leadership identified who will move this forward. And last, identify and incorporate flexibility in areas where documentation and eligibility requirements can be reduced. Next slide. A Couple more referral system considerations here. Again, I think you've heard this earlier today, but we really have to balance the urgency that we feel to, to move and to rush and to get everything executed and in place and written down. Balance with an ongoing equity-based analysis of your access and assessment processes, not only to make sure that you have a sufficient pool of applicants that is meeting your local priorities and your goals for equity and uh, improving disparities within your community, uh, but as you begin to initiate referrals, how are you doing analysis on it? And Joan's gonna talk to us in a minute about how to uh, analyze and improve our systems. Uh, one example, make sure that you've uh, got folks in place and know exactly what's gonna happen and when. So do you have a set schedule and transparent deadlines for when your system will review assessments and when they will batch or collect, put a, a group of referrals together and send those over. But it's gonna be a universe of different options and different systems, of course, across the country. And we'll continue to share out what everybody's doing, whether you're sending 20 referrals at once or you're sending each referral one by one as folks move forward. Finally, create or repurpose implementation or case conferencing meetings that you may have now in place and be sure that you're able to review your by name list, your prioritization list, and your, your applicant pools, and that you're problem solving bottlenecks. Again, is it a process uh, issue or challenge, or is it a person challenge? If, if Hannah is the end all be all of our coordinated entry system, what do we do when she takes a week off? Um, does everything just sit, or does somebody else pick it up and, and keep it moving? We're also gonna encourage everybody to, to work together collaboratively between the continuums and your housing authorities to identify key tracking areas, key points, whether it is uh, how many engagements are happening at your access points in person, online, by phone, uh, how many assessments are being completed, uh, what the status is for required documentation to, to make a referral. Once you've made a referral, what's the status? Has it been picked up yet by the housing authority? Have they had a, a housing orientation or a housing briefing yet? And then of course, once that voucher gets issued, uh, where is that housing placement? How, how, much, how long have they been searching? Have they identified the need uh, for more support in getting to lease up? And next slide. So your required memorandum of understanding includes identifying services provided to assist emergency housing voucher applicants and participants, including uh, what is offered to ensure that referrals are successful and who is going to provide those. So it's really important that in that MOU, again, you identify timelines, process, and all the partners that will take place, take part in the referral process. Next slide. And as we get to wrap up here, we just want to encourage everybody around coordination and ensuring that there's a warm transfer, right? So that the referral is not just sending an email or sending a, 
a, a protected spreadsheet of people's names and numbers, but that you really have ownership for follow-up and that all partners are clear on who's responsible at different stages of the referral process and the lease up and the lease up process. And whenever possible, providers ensure a warm transfer by introducing the client. Maybe it's on the phone, if possible in person, but making that introduction to the client to whoever they will be working with on the next steps and ensuring that participants participants know when they should expect to hear from someone, where they can go for questions, what to do if something changes. Next slide. So just a couple more key considerations for referral follow-ups. Eligible households may not have consistent contact information or access to technology. So you need to plan for addressing their needs by identifying the partners, technology, and locations that households can use to make contact or to be contacted when you're ready, when the housing authority is ready, when their next person in the process is ready for them. Uh, and, and a note on document readiness, uh, which is the collection of required documentation for eligibility. Again, that should be the responsibility of the process, not the participant. So ensure that you're planning for how documents will be collected, recorded, by whom, and identify how documents, especially around eligibility, will be shared between the participants and the partners as someone moves forward. Next slide. In planning for successful referrals, again, ensure that participant preferences, required accommodation, and housing choice are being met. If we refer to someone, uh, if we refer someone who doesn't want to be in the program, we've set ourselves up for failure, right? So again, working with people with lived experience to create easy to understand materials, explaining emergency housing vouchers to potential participants is something we can be doing right now. Ensuring that frontline staff are prepared to help prioritize households understand what the program is, what other housing options they may have, and how they can make an informed choice about whether uh, an emergency housing voucher is the right option for them at this time is something we should be working on and, and thinking about right now. And next slide. And finally, preparing for unsuccessful referrals, right? As you do for other coordinated entry referrals, consider and plan for what happens in various situations, such as a household prioritized for referral can't be located. A tenant refuses the offer of a referral. Uh, the housing authority denies assistance to a particular household who was referred over to them. Uh, a household and the provider supporting them with housing navigation services is unable to identify a unit within the search term, or a household becomes at risk of program termination. Who will step in? Who will pick up? Kind of what's the what next for that? And as you're thinking about all of this, we will look ahead to actually implementing your program and keeping an eye out for opportunities for improvement. And with that, I will hand it to Jim. All right, thank you, Micah. I think we'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so as we have already heard today, these vouchers are really gonna require PHAs and COCs to have an intentional partnership and an approach that is person-centered. And so communications between both public housing authorities and COC is gonna be critical. And what this means is that you wanna ensure that your MOU identifies the key points of contact and really clarifies roles and responsibilities for your day-to-day -day operations. Um, however, it also needs to establish your program goals and key performance metrics. And we'll talk a little bit more about performance metrics in the next slide. However, um, whatever workflow that you have and processes, they're not set or final. It really has to be a, a continuous partnership between public housing authorities and COCs uh, to really be prepared to learn together and grow as the day-to-day -day operations are going to show you what areas could really be improved and make sure that you take a look at the MOU that Hannah mentioned. I think that's gonna be very helpful in, in drafting your own. Next slide, please. Oh, no, it's this, it's that, right, that one. <laughs> um, so you've heard today that there are likely gonna be changes that will happen to your coordinated entry. And when thinking about the changes, um, you're gonna think like Michael mentioned, how can you simplify the process how can you make the process of change itself go faster? But at the same time, you wanna ensure that even though you're gonna go faster, that there is absolutely a need to be person-centered and not let this simpler and faster process stop you from being effective and from continuously improving your coordinated entry system and serving your target population. So what this means is that you're still gonna have a need to have an inclusive team 
I'm emphasizing inclusive, uh, that is really responsible for monitoring, evaluating, and adjusting. And evaluation should not be an afterthought. It should be in their planning agenda from day one. So another point uh, worth emphasizing is that utilizing a continuous quality improvement is going to be super important and if you have one now that you can look at how to use for these purposes then then good and if you don't have one then you really really do need one and it it doesn't have to be a very complicated process the the ultimate goal of having this is to assess data in a continuous manner to be able to address your your challenges early on and problem solve them together so it's not a one-time evaluation process, uh, but more of a, a cycle of improvement, a continuous cycle of improvement where you're gonna continuously uh, be identifying your challenges, problem solving together as a group, learning from the day-to-day -day operations, implementing improvement strategies, and then repeat. Um, so I think that chapter four from the coordinated entry management and data guide is going to be really helpful in, in just looking at how can you evaluate your coordinated entry system and specifically section 4.4 talks about an effectiveness evaluation and looking at how effective is your coordinated entry process in connecting people that are experiencing homelessness to appropriate referrals. Um, this resource you can also pair with the coordinated entry self-assessment um, tool. I think it's section G that I talked about evaluation. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we have one whole slide to, to talk about data. And, and I want to start us off with a quote. And it's, you can't manage what you can't measure. And this is a common quote that is attributed to Peter Drucker. Um, and it's just used a lot in project management. But what that means is that you can't know whether you or not you're successful. And in this case, success is going to be directly tied to people and improving their housing situation, um, unless success is defined and tracked. And in our context, if used right, that is going to play a, a core role in program evaluation, a lot of other things, uh, but most importantly, in, in ending homelessness. All right, so now that that's out of the way and we know that we're going to need data, a, a key step is going to be to implement a data sharing agreement that allows public housing authorities, uh, COCs, and other partners to collaborate more effectively. And having that shared data is going to uh, and there's a lot to talk about shared data, but it, overall, it's really going to help you serve households experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness better um, and getting information from both parties. And the link in the slide, which I think Micah already mentioned, will take you to a resource um, that is, is all about data sharing. It's going to pose some questions to help you prepare uh, for a data sharing agreement and also give you some templates and some examples of a data sharing agreement. All right, so uh, going back to data for program evaluation, the performance metrics that you establish in your MOU is going to inform data collection, regardless of what platform you're using. Um, so you want to make sure that you're collecting the data that you need to report out on the metrics that you have established, and also that you have a mechanism to track progress on a consistent and frequent basis. So you don't want to find out three, six months in that you establish these core metrics and that there's no mechanism for tracking these metrics and, and you're not collecting that information. And sometimes this can be easily solved by just having an upfront conversation with your core team and, and making sure that the administrators of your HMIS and whatever other data collection and HMIS is homeless management information system, uh, that they're included as part of these conversations. Um, okay, so it's also critical to use your data to advance equity. And you don't have to really create fancy reports um, and, and spend a lot of time, but there, because there really are existing reports right now that you can use as a starting point to disaggregate your data by race and ethnicity to really understand inequities. And the link in this slide is gonna uh, take you to, to that um, a resource to better understand what is available and what can you start using right now to, without having to recreate some of these reports. All right. Well, thank you for your time and all the hard work that you do. I'm going to pass it off to Janice for some Q&A. 
Thank you so much, uh, Joan. We only have a few minutes left and we have a ton of people on this webinar and a ton of questions. So I'm just gonna jump right in uh, with the first few. Um, so first we've gotten a number of questions around what has to be in the MOU, um, right? So does it have to state in detail what the process is for receiving and reviewing referrals and how much needs to be in there around uh, prioritization and all of that? Uh, for anyone who wants to jump in. And anyone who's talking might be on mute. This is Caroline, I could say a few things. Um, in terms of what needs to be in this, MLU, you know, we really encourage making sure that it's as transparent as possible to ensure that everyone kind of understands how the program will be working in the community. Um, there's no real limit. Um, and sorry, just to qualify all of this, I am not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice for how to create your MLU, but generally the MLU could be uh, between more than one COC and one PHA. Um, it would be ideal to outline what services could be available for populations and what populations will be prioritized. Uh, and it may be, you know, I know we've had a few questions of people that have multiple layers of coordinated entry within their system and who that should be with. And there's no real specific guidance. It really depends on the sy local system and who is able to commit uh, to the, the um, actions and um, requirements that are outlined in, in MOU. And legally able to sign for that. Thanks. Um, and another question is uh, how do service providers that are outside of the COC scope, right, like victim service providers or others who serve victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, and human trafficking, uh, get their referrals to the PHA? So who does the PHA enter into an MOU with? The PHA can enter into an MOU with the executive director or the signing official um, at uh, an agency serving as a victim service provider. Um, all referrals, how they are, will go to the PHA should be outlined in the MOU as Caroline just referenced. Um, and it should be extremely clear on what the process will look like and everything should be outlined within the MOU. If a victim service, this is if a victim service provider or DV provider is not already included in the coordinated entry system. Great. Um, another question here is, uh, what communities should be considering when determining who is prioritized for EHV referrals. So I guess beyond what's in the notice, right, about people sort of uh, potentially most at risk for COVID-19, especially because they're in conditions that don't allow them to socially distance or other, um, you know, situations that put them at higher risk. But what are the other sorts of layers that communities can be looking at as they build their coordinated entry changes? Sure, um, I can take a stab at that first. This is Caroline from the SNAP office. Um, there are a number of different things that communities should consider and it can not it's not a one size fits all. So there are a number of things that uh, should be considered when people are, are working together on that. The first thing is just to understand if it's legal. Um, so you need to make sure uh, that um, you're not excluding based on say disability status or other um, factors that may not fit into the fair housing laws. Um, you also wanna look at what supportive services can be used to address the people's needs um, and to look at what resources are available in your community that could be matched to those needs um, to create a really supportive system. Um, as we've gone over in previous webinars, there are a number of different places you could look for supportive services within the COC, uh, in terms of COC or ESG dollars, uh, or ESGCD is a great resource, uh, perhaps ERAP funds, uh, or um, CM, um, Medicaid in some states is a great resource. So I would recommend looking at the 
um, taking a look at the webinar that we did last week on that if you haven't had a chance. And then finally, if you have limited services, you might wanna look at how you can construct the prioritization for people that have a high level of vulnerability, may have a previous history of homelessness, but may not have the higher level of service needs um, that, you know, that may then be a great fit for at least some of the vouchers. So those could be people that are stable with them moving on or rapid rehousing, people that have stabilized in non-congregate shelters, um, or people exiting from maybe an incarceration um, situation where you don't expect the ongoing services to be needed necessarily. Thanks. Uh, and just one last question. Um, here, if a community's coordinated entry doesn't currently serve at-risk populations, um, oh no, yeah, how could they update coordinated entry to reflect this potential eligible population? Hey Janice, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. If the coordinated entry system currently doesn't serve uh, people who are at risk of homelessness, how would they update their coordinated entry system to reflect that population? That's a really great question. So the coordinated entry system is not a static tool, but is something that should be updated when new resources or priorities are identified in the community. Um, so the coordinated entry system and policies should be updated um, to allow for those referrals once the prioritization is set by the, the COC, PHA, and stakeholder group that determine the best use of EHVs in the community. And those policies and procedures then should be pushed out um, to, to allow for those referrals. Great. All right, we're at time. Thank you so much to all of the presenters uh, and to all our HUD folks. Uh, furiously answering questions in the back and to everyone who attended for your time today. Um, just a reminder, uh, PHAs already had to respond to the deadline for uh, HUD about the vouchers. Um, so those partnership conversations should be going on. The next big date is July 31st for the MOUs. And on the next slide, you can see our next webinar is making the most of EHV waivers. And that's gonna be this time next week on June 1st. Thanks so much for your time.